Let me apologize on behalf of any church that made you believe and made you think that in order to come to church, you actually had to be churchified. Matter of fact, I welcome the sinner of sinners to come into this church. Man, we will love you. We will introduce you to a marvelous grace that, that saved my soul and just let me come with all my baggage, all my addictions, all my nonsense, my bad attitude, but I came to an altar. He loved me back to life and then Jesus cleaned me. Oh, come on somebody. Hi, thanks for tuning back into our program, A Heart After God. We want to bring God's heart into your home. Hey, I'm so honored and privileged again to be able to bring the Word of God to your home, wherever it is you're watching this online, and just to bring the gospel of hope into your home. You know, today I'm going to talk to you a message that we spoke on on Good Friday. You know, the reality is we can have a good Friday because Jesus endured a bad Friday. That He took upon our sins, upon the cross, all of our hurts, all of our diseases, and Jesus broke the curse of sin and death over our life. We're so grateful for a good Friday. Matter of fact, it should be called a great Friday because of what He did, because He came down, we can go up. So I want you to lean in because I'm gonna talk to you about the who's the man in the middle. See, most people don't realize, but there wasn't just one cross on Golgotha, but there were three. And I believe that those crosses speak to who we are and how Christ came into our life. So I want you to lean in and we're going to hear about a message of Good Friday. So let's jump into the message. Well, I got a lot of uh, 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 tracks to cover here. So I'm going to jump straight into the context of this, of this text. It would surprise you to know that Luke was actually not a disciple, but he was an eyewitness. So he was not one of the 12 disciples. He was an eyewitness of the accounts that took place. You should know that Luke, the gospel of Luke in which we just read, is he is actually a physician. He's a doctor. And so he is known as the beloved physician. And so all through scripture, Paul refers to him as the beloved physician. So in other words, Luke was a very detailed person. He was an educated person. He was a doctor who saw the eyewitness accounts of all that took place in the life of Jesus. It would also surprise you to know that Luke writes more of the New Testament than any other writer in the New Testament. So Paul the Apostle may have written more books in the, New, in the New Testament, but that Luke actually writes more chapters and more words than anybody else in the New Testament. The book of Luke is actually one of the most comprehensive gospel accounts that documents the life of Jesus all the way from his announcement from John the Baptist to his ascension back into heaven when he ascends back to the Father. And I should add there that he went up and he's going to come back again for a church. Come on, somebody, like a twinkle of an eye. Somebody say amen. You still believe Jesus is coming back. Somebody say amen. And if you don't believe he's coming back, I'll promise you that you're going to go see him. But that meeting is going to take place. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, you better be ready. No, I'm joking. Okay, so Jesus is coming back. But Luke writes more comprehensive in his gospel. He is more detailed, obviously, because he's a doctor. He's, he's giving you exact details. Now, another huge point that is imperative to know that most people don't know is that Luke actually was not of Hebrew and Jewish descent. Luke is known to be a Gentile. Now, that's huge, very huge, because most scholars believe that he was a Gentile. In other words, he was not one of God's chosen people from the Jewish. And for those that understand is if you were born of Jewish descent, you were of God's chosen people. But Gentiles, we were engrafted into the promises of God and as God's chosen people. So Luke's account as a Gentile is saying, man, I got into this thing because of what Jesus did. I was, I was engrafted into the blessing of Abraham in Genesis chapter 5. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 12, the blessings that I will be blessed, that I will be a blessing, that I will have an inheritance, and I will be engrafted as a child of God. Somebody say amen. And so it is no coincidence. Let's go somewhere. It's no coincidence that Luke, who was a Gentile, that his gospel in the Gospel of Luke, written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that Luke actually deals with how Jesus spoke to outcast people more than any other gospel. 
So a lot of the accounts in the Gospel of Luke is how Jesus was speaking with people who felt outcasted, who felt like they didn't fit in to being part of God's chosen people. And so Luke spends a lot of time talking about that. In Luke's Gospel, 10 times he says the good news, where other Gospels only mention it one time, the good news. In the book of Acts, which Luke wrote, he writes the good news 15 times. And so 25 times Luke is trying to tell people the gospel is not bad news. The gospel is good news. Somebody say amen. And so don't, don't let nobody condemn you when you're walking around telling you, and then God is going to just smack you down like a, and he's going to just ruin. Man, what are you talking about? God's grace wants to, it is good news. He's calling salvation. He's calling life change. He's calling healing. Somebody say good news. And so when people try to bring you bad news, be like the gospel means good news. Somebody say amen. And so uh, Luke is talking about the good news. Now, this is so important. I'm giving you some context here because Luke then zeroes in on this conversation that he is witnessing, I witness to it, of Jesus being on Calvary and these two criminals who are literally being crucified with him. And he zeroes in on a conversation with probably two of the most outcast of outcast people who are dying with Jesus. And as scripture says, one person was on the left and one person was on the right, and Jesus was on the middle. And Luke begins to detail this to us of this conversation that's happening literally out at Calvary in the moment, Good Friday, 2,000 years ago. And these two men that are literally with Jesus are being crucified with him, and this is going down. Tell your neighbor, it's going down. Like it's, it's in the middle of, this is, this is like important. This is, the, this is the, the pinnacle of Jesus's life. He came to save us of our sins. He came for this moment where now Satan thought he was gonna beat him, but Jesus like, this is my moment where you think you're gonna kill me, but I'm gonna raise again. I'm gonna forgive my people of their sins. Come on, somebody. This is the moment. And both these men are hanging with Jesus, you know, at, on the cross. And scripture tells us that both of these guys were convicted by the same legal system. They were guilty of individual crimes. They were condemned to die the same death. Both of them were firsthand witnesses and had views like no other. Both of them were looking at Jesus and were seeing who Jesus were. Now, we don't know, scripture doesn't tell us, and I'm giving you some context because this, 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 this is gonna speak to somebody. We don't know where these criminals are from, we don't know the names of these criminals from the left and to the right. We don't know what crimes they committed. All we know is that they were crucified with Jesus, one on the left and one on the right. We don't know much about them other than that day they were both being crucified for crimes they committed. And on, on, on the surface, it would seem like both of them were identical people, but they were actually both very different. Because what made these two guys different the guy on the, I'm trying to see, you, right and left, okay? So this is right, this is left. What made both of these guys different, the person on the right and the person on the left, was how they viewed the person in the middle. <laughs> I get excited. It's like the tour guide that knows you're about to get something. You know, it's like, here we go. <laughs> They both seem identical. Both were criminals. Both were being punished. Both were going to die. But what made them different was how they viewed the guy in the middle. One of them hurled insults. Save yourself and save me. Because, you know, I want to get up out of here too. He says, if you're the son of God, which I don't, now I'm just assuming, okay, don't be like, well, how do you know it was the guy on on the left. I don't, but we're just going to say he was, this guy on the left is the one who the ins insults because if he ain't right, you know, he left thee. Come on somebody. All right. <laughs> so you better get right or else you're going to be left. <laughs> Dun -dun -dun. Come on. All right. Sorry. The jokes get worse, but the message gets better. Just stay with me. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, get right or you'll be left. No, I'm just going to do that. All right. The guy on the left is hurling insults. 
And he's telling, he's saying, he's on there. The people are mocking Jesus on the cross. They're, they're, the people are saying, man, if you're the son of God, you know, look at that. You saved other people and you can't even save yourself. The Bible says, then the soldiers got in on the mocking and they're like, yeah, if you're, if you're, if you're the Christ, why don't you, you know, you saved other people, you can't even save yourself. And then this guy's like, yeah, let me get in on that. He's like, you know what? If you're the son of God, why come you can't even save yourself? And then by the way, save me too. Save me. But the guy on the right, he checks the guy on the left. And he says, hey, man, we're being punished rightfully because we're guilty. We both are criminals. He's being punished. He's innocent. And while that guy wanted to be saved for himself from pain, the guy on the right told him, hey, remember me, Lord. I want to be saved from sin. And what makes it different, I have it up here on the screens for you, is this. One man wanted freedom from his pain, while the other man wanted freedom from his sin. <laughs> One man was, I just want freedom from this nonsense I'm dealing with in my life. Can you just, Jesus, hook a brother up, hook a sister up, so I don't got to deal with this pain, and I can just go on with my life and how I want to go on. While the other man said, no, no, no. Listen, we are all sinners, and we, a lot of the mess we're dealing with is because of the mess we put ourselves in. And the reality is, Lord, I want to be saved from my sin, and I want to know that when I die, I'm going to go into paradise with you. Come on, somebody, say amen. And what made it different is one wanted freedom from pain, the other one wanted freedom from sin. He got to the heart of the issue. What made the man on the, on the left and the man on the right different is how they viewed the man in the middle. Tell your neighbor, how do you view the man in the middle? Three men died that night. All three of them died. But not all three went to the same place. All, man, all mankind dies, but not all mankind goes to the same place. The difference, how you view the man in the middle. The criminal on his left and the criminal on the right. All criminal, but here's the fact. We're the criminals. Here's the fact. We are the criminals, all of us. We all broke God's laws. Bible says there is no not one righteous. We're all unrighteous. All of us. Bible says that all have fallen short by the glory of God. That not one of us. Uh, girl, I don't care how, how on fleet those eyebrows are. We are all unrighteous. No, these things are righteous. No. <laughs> Scripture says we are all have been condemned. We have all disobeyed God. We have all turned our back on God. We are all born into sin. We are all broken and hopeless. We are all criminals. We are all, you know, have been disobedient. But what makes the difference between a believer and a non-believer is not because I'm any better. What makes me different is how I view the man in the middle. It's God save me from my sin. Somebody say amen. You see the man on the left, we're going to call him lefty. Lefty hurled insults. And he said, if you're the son of God, save me. Save yourself and save me. And see, this voice is still alive today. It doesn't use the same words, but it has the same spirit. And it says things like this. If you're God, then why am I going through this pain? If you're God, then why did my parents separate? If you're God, then why did I lose my house? Why did I lose my job? Why do I have this sickness? If you're God, how come you ain't saving me from my pain? But the other voice says, because we live in a sinful world and this world is broken, but he saved us from our sin. <laughs> Come on, somebody. I hope you get this tonight. I hope you get this. Because if you don't get this, you will misinterpret what salvation is.
You will give your life to God. We will come to a Good Friday service. We'll take communion. We'll sing the cross. I'm so grateful for the cross. But when you walk out of those doors, you will say, God, you didn't really save me because I still get into my broken car, my messed up home, my, my kids that ain't acting right. But we've got to know, no, God, you didn't might not save me from my pain because I live in a broken world, but you saved me from sin. And when I die, I can rise again. Come on, somebody say amen. It's a whole different perspective. Because if not, we will be lefty. And you always know when people act lefty. They start, you know, nobody know. God don't, God don't love this world. If he did, look what we're going through. If you're God, save yourself and me. But right says no. Remember me in paradise. You see, the man on the right wanted freedom from sin. But the Bible tells us, look at this verse, verse 42. This man, this, this just jumped out and like just hugged me. Verse 42. The one on the right, then he said, Jesus. Someone say Jesus. Jesus. He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This is amazing. Because the guy on the right, he didn't say, Jesus, save me. He actually said, Jesus, Lord. In other words, Lord, that Greek word means person in charge, Lord of all. That means, Lord, you are ruler. You sit on the throne. You are conquering sin. You are conquering the grave. Lord. Here's the difference. Sometimes on the left, just save me. The guy on the right, I want you to be my Lord. We live in a generation that wants a savior but doesn't want a Lord. But he can never be savior until he's our Lord and savior. Oh, I know. Come on, somebody. I know. <laughs> no, no, no. Just save me. And then let me go about my own life. God says, no, I didn't come just to save you. I came to be Lord of your life. Someone say, I want a Lord of my life. Come on. I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. And so he confesses, and, and, and he actually, before Romans 10, 9, and 10 was ever written, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Before that was even written, he was already operating and saying, Jesus, Lord, remember me when I die. He was already operating in the sinner's prayer or in that salvation prayer that he was already seeing Jesus as Lord. But here's where the power kicks in. Jesus was Lord. He was king, but he didn't look like a king. Jesus was bloody. Jesus was actually at his worst moment physically. But this man saw Jesus at his best, at his best even when he was at his worst. And so he says, no, I know. I got faith that you are my Lord and my Savior. And so this criminal saw Jesus at his worst, but he believed that it was his best. And so the criminal saw him as king. He saw him as the Savior, even when the world didn't think that he looked like a Savior. And can I just tell you that there will be times in your life that people will come to you and they will say, oh, that Savior of yours, he don't look like no Savior. He don't look like no Lord. You're going to say this. I know that to you in the physical, it may not look like he's Lord, but I'm telling you he's Lord and he's He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and he's coming back and he's on the throne and I don't care who occupies 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington DC what I care is who sits on the throne in heaven above and he's the Lord of all and that's who got my future and so don't judge me by what you see on the outside because I'm free from sin or oh, y'all better give God a clap in Jesus name and so I'm going to give you the picture of Christianity. You ready for this? This changed my life today in a good way. As a believer on Good Friday, what I am in life is I'm a crucified sinner. Trust in a crucified Savior. No longer I live, but Christ lives through me. Paul says that I may know him that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, but also in the fellowship of his suffering. That Lord, 
that even though I'm going through stuff in this broken, sinful world, even though that other people's sins mess up my, my life, even though sometimes people will mock me, will offend me, even when it does, I may look like I'm the minority because everybody else is ruling insults. God, I know you are Lord because I'm a crucified sinner believing in a crucified Savior and trusting in a crucified Savior that you're coming back. You ought to put a God, give God a clap right there and just say amen. He said, Jesus, Lord, no matter what people, leaders, or anybody says, he believed. And I want to give you these three quick points. I'm going to give you points. Lord, help me. Okay, here we go. Number one, write this on. Here's something we can learn from the conversation on Calvary. Here's what we can learn. The conversation on Calvary. Number one, what you can learn is that it's never too late. Can I give somebody some hope tonight? Can I, tell, can I give you some hope? Because I, I just feel like I got I to gotta let somebody know this, is that you are like that crucified Savior. And let me tell you something. You might think like it's too late. You may think it's too late to turn to Jesus, but I got news for you. As long as there is breath in your lungs, as long as there's a beat in your heart, the invitation is still there. It is never too late to come to Jesus. Because this man came to Jesus literally at his last moments. At his last moments. Can someone get saved at their last moments? Yes. And they're going to go to the same heaven you're going to go to for serving God all your life. And be like, but that's not fair. No, that's called grace. Yeah. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, don't, 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 don't be redlining it, though. Because <laughs> people are like, I'll just wait till, I'll just wait till I get, you might not have that opportunity. Yeah. Don't be messing with your, with your eternity like that. Yeah. People say, I'll just, I'll serve God when I get older. That's a great plan if you're promised to get older. Nobody, the Bible says we're not promised our next breath. Jesus can come back right now. Just kidding. All right. <laughs> Welcome to Good Friday service, some of you that just woke up. I'm at my first point, and you can turn with me to, no, I'm just joking. All right. <laughs> Tell your neighbor it's never too late. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, watch what the Bible says. Then Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Remember this and don't ever forget it. There are no conditions to come. There are no conditions to come. Someone say there are no conditions to come. You need to hear this because legalism says you can't come to God till you clean yourself up. God says come just the way you are. Just come. Somebody say amen. I better hear a louder clap than that from people that have been forgiven. Jesus Jesus doesn't say, first get your attitude together, go clean yourself up, buy a nice church outfit, then you can come. He says, no, come. Matter of fact, the only prerequisite, weary and heavy burdened. In other words, you got issues, perfect, come. And we've got to remember this marvelous grace. Because if not, we will start putting conditions on to come to Jesus. We start coming in church and feel like, why are, why are people messed up in church? Because that's where you're supposed to go when you got heavy burdens and you're worried. Somebody say amen. If not, what will end up happening is we start thinking when you come to church, you got to act like you had it all together. You know what? Let me apologize on behalf of any pastor. Let me apologize on behalf of any church that made you believe and made you think that in order to come to church, you actually had to be churchified. Matter of fact, I welcome the sinner of sinners to come into this church. Man, we will love you. We will introduce you to a marvelous grace that, that saved my soul and just let me come with all my baggage, all my addictions, all my nonsense my bad attitude but I came to an altar he loved me back to life and then Jesus cleaned me oh come on somebody clean me don't look at me like you came to God and you were a trophy don't look at me like when you first came to church you walked in all put together I remember some of you walked in you had that look on your face you hated everybody and you walked in broken but Jesus loved you and now you're gonna look at people that got problems like why are you coming in here like that why why are you taking my seat man Jesus saved you and he's gonna say Oh my God, I feel an anointing right now. Christians start getting. <laughs> it's never too late. Jesus says, Come. He says, Come. Come just the way you are. Now, the beautiful thing about God is He won't leave you the way you are. But He says, Come just the way you are. 
I got to say that to somebody because a lot of times people won't come to Jesus because his people try to hold them back, try to hold them back. Can I just tell, also encourage somebody that maybe you're believing God for somebody and you're talking like this, they're too far gone, they'll never get saved. Ah, uh, not, not, not my brother, you don't know my brother. You don't know my sister. Oh, pastor, you don't know my wife. I mean, that. if Jesus, I mean, I'm telling you, Jesus can do a miracle. I don't know. I mean, you don't, you don't, you don't know. You don't know my sister-in-law. I mean, I think Satan's, that's Satan's sister. I think it is. I don't know. I know it's not biblical. But listen, we start having this language as believers. The, the conversation at Calvary proves to us it's never too late. Because this man was in his last breaths. Don't ever stop praying for the people you're believing to get saved. Don't ever stop believing God. Because I be, we, don't know, we don't know this. Again, I'm reading into this. But I, I bet you that that boy's mama was like, thank God Jesus accepted him on that cross. I pray that message blessed you. And as I like to say, got you that much closer to the heart of God. Listen, it's not because we're good, but it's because he's good and he forgave us of all of our sins. You know, that Good Friday, that's that, that made our lives to be good and right before God. That through the blood of Jesus that was shed, that it covers all of our past, all of our sins. And I want you to know today that you are forgiven. Salvation is Jesus plus nothing. It's because it's a gift that comes from heaven. And so I want you to know you're forgiven. All you gotta do is receive Jesus into your heart. Listen, maybe you're watching this and you're far from God and you wanna receive Jesus Christ into your heart. You need the forgiveness of sins. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth and we believe he raised from the dead, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that we will be saved. And I want you to just say this prayer with me. If you wanna receive Christ into your heart, say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Say, I believe you died on the cross for my sins, that you were buried, but you rose again. And I confess you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. If you said that prayer, scripture tells us that old things pass away and everything becomes brand new. Today is your first day of a fresh start with Jesus Christ. Hey, this is what I want you to do. I want you to read your Bible. I want you to connect to a Bible-believing church and to begin to grow your walk with God. And if you're ever in the Orange County area, you can come visit one of our services. You can visit our website at freedomhouseoc.org for all the details and information. We'd love to meet you in person and come worship the Lord with us at one of our services here in the North Orange County, Fullerton area and if you want to visit our website you can go on our website to listen to more messages and stay connected with all things freedom house oc make sure to follow us on social media at freedom house oc you can follow me at josiah silva love to encourage you on a daily basis hey remember no matter where you're at no matter what you're doing always go after the heart of god we'll see you soon god bless